Good morning. After all my years in the field of leadership development, I'm still inspired by human behavior and potential in organizations. I still marvel after I work with clients and I see them changing their paradigms and then changing the cultures of their organizations. It still excites me when I work with a leader who is leading a dysfunctional team and helping them make it whole again. I just love what I do. When leaders take a look in the mirror, they have the potential of creating a culture that they dreamed of, one that has a community of employees and customers moving in the same positive and productive direction. You'll learn today that the CEOs of San Diego's fastest growing companies do just that. They look in the mirror and they are very intentional about the cultures that they want to create for their companies both today and for tomorrow. I'm very, and you'll also see that their best practices are very much aligned with the research in the field. So you can imagine how fun it was for me uh, once I got them all on the phone to hear their stories and uh, learn about what they did around customer service and how they treated their employees, kept them accountable. I'm very pleased to be sharing this research for the first time here at USC's Master of Science in Executive Leadership program. This is a program that very much resonates with me, not just because of the curriculum and the staff, but also because of the values. And I've been reading and sharing Ken Blanchard's work with my clients for many years. So I just thought, yes, absolutely, I would love to present here. So thank you, Christina, for that. So before I present the seven actions that I found to be common themes in my interviews with the CEOs I interviewed, I want to share a little bit about leadership's impact on culture, and then I'll give you a background of how I started this research and what inspired me. I'll share the eight CEOs I interviewed, and then we'll go through the seven trends that came up in my research. And lucky for us, we'll have Will and Brian share some of their stories. And then I'll talk about some applications in your settings, in your organizations, whether you work for a small organization or a large one. So I'm sure you all know this, leadership is at the heart of everything. And it impacts how you treat your customers, the speed in which your organization moves through the organizational life cycle. And yes, there's a life cycle just like Humans have it, organizations have it, and it also impacts how engaged your employees are. And you'll see some quotes from Ken Blanchard throughout this because I would do it anyway, he's awesome. Um, so I wanna ask you, the audience, what, how would you define employee engagement? Sense of responsibility. Sense of responsibility, yes. When an employee feels valued and contributes, thank you. A unified focus towards the goals of the organization and alignment to the Love that, yes. How do you know if your employees are really engaged? Because that sounds great. How does it play out in an organization? They're bringing ideas to the table to help the organization grow. So you could physically see it. People are coming up with ideas because they feel aligned with the values of the organization. Great. What else do you see? They feel empowered when they focus on their business. Absolutely. What happens when employees are not engaged? <laughs> That's the bigger question, yes. <laughs> Absenteeism, they don't want to show up. They're on Facebook. They're on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Poor work performance. Poor work performance. So uh, let me share a couple pieces of research with you from uh, the Gallup organization. So, and, and so much of this is intuitive, but it's so important to remember. Negative employees can scare off every customer you have. So imagine an employee who doesn't feel good about the company and then having them speak with your customers. It's not a good thing. Nine out of 10 people say they are more productive when they are around positive people. And 65% of Americans received no recognition in the workplace last year. 
Any of you here? So what the Gallup organization did, they came up with the Q12, 12 questions that you can ask an employee to determine how engaged this employee is. And all of their research with thousands of companies showed that the higher the employee engagement score, the more motivated the employee is, and ultimately, the lower the turnover, much like the things you all notice, higher sales growth, better productivity, and customers are more loyal to employees who care about them. Leadership also impacts how quickly an organ, uh, organization goes through its life cycle. So just as humans, an organization has an infancy, childhood, adolescence, up until it is in its prime, and it's now birthing infant organizations. When an organization is in the infancy stage, the CEO, the owner, really has to make quick, quick decisions. This is a time when it's in go, go, go mode. There's pressure to keep the company alive and build partnerships. Sometimes there is more work than there are people to do it. And as the company grows, the leadership also needs to grow. The same leadership that worked in infancy will not necessarily work as well in adolescence. And this is uh, actually a time where it goes from go, go, go to no, 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 where the team that you've built is saying, wait a minute, that's too much risk. That worked before, that doesn't work now. And one of the things that is important to note is this is the time when you are building your culture and the more you pay attention to that, the better, you know, when we think of culture, how things are done around here. The more you are concerned about that, the better culture and good habits you'll have when you get to the prime. And the owner's dilemma is also around this time where it's important to do one of two things. Either let go and hire a CEO and delegate, or look in the mirror and make the changes you need for where the organization is now in its growth. So how would you all define culture? We always read about it, we talk about it. What are some simple ways to define culture? Values and action, yes? How we do things here. How we do things here, yes. The inherent beliefs of a group of people, how they react to them. Exactly, so when you go into an organization, what are some things that will help you determine what type of culture it is? Reading their mission statement will certainly help you get an idea of the formal aspects of the culture. Seeing their website, seeing the things they have on the wall, that could give you some clues, seeing what the goals are. But then, what about when you go in to a room of employees and talk to them? What kind of things would you find out about the culture? Whether or not they're happy where they work. Uh -huh. Absolutely, yes. How much confidence they feel in them, themselves as opposed to the Exactly. That's where the real story is. The informal aspects of culture that are it's under the iceberg. Because you can have the best information on the website and uh, oh wow, this looks like a great company to work for. But it's really when you go in there and you listen to the stories, you talk to the customers, you that's when you understand really how things are done around here for better or worse. It's one of the most powerful tools a manager can wield because like we talked about in the organizational life cycle, at some point the owner, the leader needs to let go and be able to delegate and when you could do that and you have built the, the culture of accountability and you've built a vision, it's much easier to be able to let that go. So when you look at these leaders, what words come to your mind about the culture of their organizations? Visionary. Visionary. <clears throat> Fun. Fun, yes. Diverse. diverse, yes, they are all diverse. Risk takers. Hard work. Hard work, yes. Innovators. So 
as I, when I work with my clients and I help them get a vision of what kind of leader they want to be, no matter how long they've been a leader, and no matter how long they've been running the organization, I ask them, who do you aspire to be like? Who do you, who do you read about that makes you excited? And these are some of the leaders that come to mind. But however, they're very diverse. There is no one formula. It's really about taking your values and uh, seeing what else that has inspired you and then creating the vision that you want. And as I interviewed the CEOs in this research, a lot of the words that you described for these CEOs were the words that I heard uh, and felt about the CEOs of San Diego's fastest growing companies. So to give you a background, it was fall, it was a warm fall day last October. I had my business journal and I was just going through it, really interested in all of the different best of lists, fastest growing in different areas. And I really got fixated on the fastest growing private companies list. And I just wondered to myself, how do they lead? What's their perspective? What do they do with their customers? What advice would they give to other CEOs? And of course, I assumed they had great products, great services, but I knew, being in this field, I knew there was more to it than that. And I was very curious. And uh, so I called a friend of mine. I said, you know, I just want to call these CEOs, at least you know, the top 20, because I'm sure all of 100 were great. And I just want to do this. What do you think of that? Is that crazy? And she said, well, I would love to read the results of that research. So that, I think that was just what I needed to hear. And uh, I took it on. I started calling them. And uh, it's not like I'm Ken Blanchard or Marshall Goldsmith to say, oh, sure, you know, we'll let you interview us. But it took a little bit of selling. And uh, I came up with 10 questions to ask them. I didn't want it to be too short or too long. And these were some of the questions. I asked them what uh, inspired them, how they in how they promoted innovation, how they kept people accountable, how they dealt with their customers, and how they developed their employees. The eight CEOs I interviewed are from a range of industries. And look at the growth rate they had from 2008 to 2010. Remarkable. So, Without further ado, I would like to introduce two of the CEOs who are here with us today, Will Dryden and Brian Rott. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Yet another reason to feel pride in San Diego when you have CEOs like this just doing it right. So there were seven themes that came up in the research. The first one was that the these CEOs hired for the culture that they wanted. So when I talked to Jason Kulpa, the CEO of Underground Elephant, he shared with me, work is more of a community and less of a place to go get a check. It's a lot of time to hang out with somebody and you want to feel like you're having fun and being appreciated. And part of the way they hire at Underground Elephant, and by the way, I don't know what that stands for, it's a secret, is I tried to find out when I was at the office, um, is they hire around personality. Same thing with Adam Daly of Ludus Tours and Dave Dutch. The second trend is that innovation is a part of everyday work and not just an event. So there are many companies who will have um, quarterly offsites and retreats to get everyone's creative juices flowing, which I think is fantastic. However, it should become a regular part of the culture, and that is what some of these CEOs do. Adam Daly, for example, has bi-weekly meetings and everyone has to come up with a new idea. So imagine that. You're const if, if I had to come up with a new idea every week, I would be talking to customers, friends, going online, and looking for inspiration, and that's part of their culture. Um, Brian, if you could share with us what you guys do around innovation. And is your mic on? Yeah, can you hear Great. me? Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, it's nice to be here, um, an honor as well to speak with you. So um, in an innovative uh, company, where, 
the backup, my business is in the mobile service of electric golf cars and utility vehicles, a very small niche business that's, that's um, uh, a side business to our main company, which is the distribution of those vehicles to companies um, and private individuals. Uh, the military, places like the university, and, and individuals uh, nonetheless. But So we're in a very, very small industry with very little innovation. So what, what we bring to our uh, staff is having the um, foresight of utilizing technology to help drive our progress and to set systems and processes that innovate the way that our industry works. Very few companies like ours utilize uh, mobile dispatching and uh, the use of uh, smartphones through the, uh, through the service department. Um, so we're constantly trying to keep ahead of the curve from a technology standpoint, but also giving our customers a high level of service that one would expect from one of the, 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 the best automotive deep, uh, service centers that you might take your car to, or maybe a air conditioning HVAC system company that would come out to your house. We innovate by utilizing the technology and, and coming up with new programs to help drive sales and customer uh, retention. And one of the examples you'd given me is you let your team take on a project and you don't micromanage and usually it turns out well. If it doesn't, you help them out. Do you have a quick example of one of those projects? Well, as an example, we have, uh, we do a tremendous amount of recondition in, in, the, in my uh, primary business, which is called Cartmart, we have a, a tremendous amount of reconditioning in the equipment that we come back off lease. We're turning hundreds, sometimes thousands of vehicles a year. All of that's done here in, in our facility in San Marcos. Uh, some, of the, some of our team members have come up with a system of reconditioning the vehicles in a facility down in Mexico where they've, where they've taken this project on completely on their own and started to drive more interest in, and more of the projects down to a maquilador scenario in Mexico versus doing it the same way we've been doing it for 40, 50 years in our, in our single facility. So they want to see more productivity. They want to see more um, gross profit on the, on the actual sale. So we figured how to bring our equipment down into a facility where we can build it for less and uh, and they all will benefit from that. That's something that comes from them Great. on an idea that they took on their own. Thank you. The third trend, and this was something that came up almost with all of the CEOs I interviewed, is their communication. And I meant this in a very positive way. They're in your face, meaning that they manage by walking around. They are popping their heads into everyone's office, chatting with them, letting them know that they are very comfortable with them coming in and sharing ideas. Um, Will, I'm sure you'd love to share how you do this with the team, with everyone here. Good morning. I got to stand or uh, I'll fall asleep. <laughs> okay, so uh, Coast Bike Training started in August 2008, and this airplane is an absolutely beautiful aircraft. If most people think of flight training or they think of a Cessna, something from 1970s with rivets, this airplane goes 212 knots up to 25,000 feet, and it's Pardon me for saying this, it's sexy. <laughs> Aviation, to me, was Top Gun. It was Tom Cruise and Iceman out there. And when you get into aviation, it's a bunch of old guys telling you how it has to be. And it was just super frustrating to me. I was in this for 13 years as a professional pilot now, and I just got fed up with guys telling me how it should be. So I said, I want to be home with my family, and as a pilot, this gives me the opportunity. So Coast Bike Training started. <clears throat> the very first thing I had to do is learn what all these customers wanted, because I don't think I was the only one who wanted something like this. We opened our doors and we started listening. When people walk in, all of the management has to greet them. 
at least 50% of the time, we have to come across their path and their life cycle with our company. They need to know that there is a company there because they are with our flight instructors most of the time. They're in a very intimate environment, but they need to know they can have someone to fall back on. So first thing we do is we greet them. Second thing we do in staying face to face is when our instructor pilot and our clients get back from a flight, this is really simple. We bring them a bottle of water. The management walks out to the aircraft and greets them. And as they're greeted, they're coming off of this major adrenaline rush. They don't even know they're necessarily on, but you get so much honest feedback from your pilot, instructor pilot, and your client. Because they're going to tell you all the emotions that they just went through. And it's kind of an unguarded situation where you can really listen and gain from it. <clears throat> and from greeting the people when they walk in the door, greeting them when they come back from a flight, lastly, all the management keeps their door open. When you have a concern, concern as a customer, if our door is open and they know that we've greeted them when they come through the doors, they know that when they get back from a flight, we're going to give them a bottle of water. It's a friendly environment. They'll come and tell you what you need to know to keep your company growing instead of finding out that that customer has left and you have nothing left. So our innovation to keep our customers super happy and our employees super happy is be in front of their face. Don't be afraid to hear something bad because it's just going to help you grow so the next person doesn't experience that bad. So Thank that's you. How we engage that's face great. To face. Looking in the mirror. Thank you for that. <coughs> Brian, what do you guys do in terms of communication? I will well stood, so I'm going to stand up. <laughs> um, I actually have a question. Uh, how many here like to get your hands dirty? Yeah, so all of you who raised your hands are going to do very well in business if you haven't already done so, because for me, uh, my communication is just that, getting my hands dirty. I communicate with the employees by being there on the floor, in the field, in their face, in the customer's face, and working with them sometimes. If it's not uh, helping to fix a vehicle, if it's not going out on a sales service call with one of the employees, or just frankly dealing with the customers as they walk in. Um, in my business, I'm just one of the guys. Most of the time people never recognize me as the CEO and we have a lot of people coming through our door on a regular basis and one of the reasons that all, one of the things that always shocks them is that my desk sits right in the center of the, of the showroom, right in the ground floor. There's no, there are no walls. It's just me and my desk and I communicate to my customers and my employees in a very open my, manner because I feel that there should be nothing to hide because in our business, just like in most any other businesses, you want your, your customers and your people to know what you're doing so they feel, they feel comfortable with you. So I sit on the floor and people come in and go all day long. I get no work done most of the time, but the work that I get done helps them and, it, uh, and, that, and that breeds that good communication in our business. Thank you so much. Um, Matt Garrett from TGG Accounting, who couldn't be here with us today, um, one of the quotes that he shared with me that really made an impact was, I don't want to be seen as the man behind the curtain, right, in Oz. And he likes to go out and talk to his staff and create that same type of culture. Same with Adam Daly and Dave Dutch. Number four, they develop their employees even if it means they may leave. Because in some of the industries, for example, um, with Vita Pharmaceuticals, the employees are there for a certain period of time and then they may move on to CVS or another pharmacy and they know that and they still develop them and still give them their best and have goodbye parties when they leave. Will, uh, at his organization, does that as well. You shared a couple of photos with us. If you could talk to that. Yeah. Um, flight instruction is kind of a bridge to a final goal for the instructor pilots. They can go be an airline pilot, corporate, uh, Jesse, who's in the far right side of that picture, he's going to be a missionary over in Africa. He, and uh, Jesse started with us, and part of our interview process is, what's your end goal? Because we know that they're going to go there. So protecting our customer, protecting our employee and the company, we know when they're going to leave, and we have plenty of heads up, because that instructor pilot, he's going to have 10 uh, 10 customers that he's teaching. So if he picks up and leaves, which is the trend for our industry, it'll give me one day heads up and then I got 10 customers with no one to work with them. They're highly upset. 
and then I lost business for us. So for Jesse alone, we foster him. A lot of guys with airlines, we know they'll be with us for about a year. Uh, the result of knowing what our employees are gonna do and us helping them grow throughout the process, because there are different paths you have to take in while they're working with us to get to those goals, is we're actually not losing our employees. We're keeping 90% of our instructor pilots and maybe 10 of them, 10%, are going on to the airlines or going to be a missionary pilot. Whatever they go do, they're ambassadors for us wherever they go because they know that we really cared for them during the process. They come back and they're always open to come work for us. We have a lot of them doing contract pilot stuff and we can call on them where we're overbooked and they'll happily come back. It's never a severed bad relationship, so. <laughs> John right here, he was my very first flight instructor and uh, he's kind of crazy awesome guy, but um, he w went on to be a pilot at American, and then now he's flying for Jet Suite, a private corporate jet company, and he's a contract pilot that comes back and forth with us. Unbelievable employee, but every single one of my employees are my friends, and I don't take them all out to dinner, but man, I can sit and listen to anything they have, and they feel like they can come in and talk to us because they know we're helping them get to their end goal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Brian, uh, you had shared with me, you promote from within a lot. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I believe in promoting from within because um, the first job I had at Cartmart was, uh, was wielding a broom for about three months. And uh, I started sweeping the floors. From there, I moved into um, washing the cars in the lot maybe delivering the cars, moving the cars in the showroom, detailing cars all the way through the service department. Um, yeah, <laughs> progressed and effectively I've held every position in the company. And we have a 49 employee company at Cartmart and Superior Onsite Service. And, and I've held them all. So I believe in the promotion from within. I believe in developing somebody from a, uh, a floor sweeper through up and, and, and through the ranks. It's not an easy task to do because it's very hard to bet on a particular individual, but if you give them the right uh, support and you give them the right training and you're fair and honest with them, it's very likely that that promotion from within will come natural to you because um, in today's day of entitlement where most younger people and even seniors feel this, this entitlement for instant success, I come in, I would expect to have such and such already given to me, and quite frankly, um, I don't subscribe to that. I believe you have to come in, pay your dues, and from there you go. And so um, selecting the right person in your hiring process is sometimes a complete crapshoot, because if you, bet, if you order them in on um, experience, you might just get let down. If you order them in on uh, on just your gut and your, their personality and their, and their hard work ethics and their ability to get their hands dirty, then you very likely have an opportunity to do that promotion from within. It'll come natural. <clears throat> At least it does for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Adam Daly of Ludus Tours does is send out his staff around the world where they have tours um, for different sports, active sports uh, competitions. And even if they're not working on that particular project, he'll still send them out so that they feel comfortable talking about what happens when customers are out there. So as the, part of the selling process, it's so critical for a person to be able to really describe the experience. And he doesn't think, oh, if I invest this, they might leave. He just owns it as part of the culture he wants to create of employees feeling very much part of um, the process. Accountability, so many of these CEOs are very organized with keeping uh, accountability for the goals that the employees have. For example, Deb Hubers of La Vida Pharmaceuticals, it's very clear to the staff they need to fill 100 prescriptions a day. Every morning they have a powwow, they talk about it, it's very clear to them. Um, Jason Culpa, as well as Mike Fennison, described very uh, specific programs they have for how to keep employees 
very clear on what they're accountable for on a weekly, monthly basis, and they follow through with it, which is so important. I have helped many companies create performance management systems that are based around the goals and the core values of the organization, but if you don't keep it up and make it part of the culture, it'll just go away, and uh, employees are looking for that. They really like to be held accountable. Employees like to receive feedback. When we talked about the Q12 and the 12 questions that show if an employee's engaged, one of them is, do I get feedback for my work? Do I get praise for my work? And that's all tied to having work that people could be accountable to. Another trend that I saw was community and fun is part of the job. There were so many times when I interviewed the CEOs and the word family came up over and over again. And um, the CEO shared everything they do to create this fun community. So for example, um, Jason Culpa of Underground Elephant will sometimes have a uh, mariachi band come in randomly at lunchtime and just surprise the crew. Um, they, they try to make an environment that they enjoy for themselves and for their employees. Do either of you have an example of what you do? Because I know it sounds really fun where you work, so do you have an example? I am the mariachi band. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I pretty much whip my team all day long. We don't. We we we, we probably uh, there's probably a lot more room for fun, and I've been uh, I've been working uh, very hard to have people in my business bring in more of that. Um, but to be honest, for me, it's a scenario where it's 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 we're in a growth period, so. To, to maintain that balance of fun. Mm -hmm. Underground Elephant is a fun business just in its name. Mm -hmm. But in our industry, in my business, um, it, it's, it's, it works a little bit different for me. So I, mm -hmm. I hate to let you down on that aspect. We're just working. Well, <laughs> hey, that's the whole thing. You're so honest. And you're able to look in the mirror and just say what you see. How about you, Will? You know, um, I personally take an interest in all of our employees. And uh, we have them over to our house every maybe quarter, hopefully we reach for that, if not every other quarter. And we have a barbecue for them and they can bring all their family and friends. And we take the uh, fun element and we take it out of the office because it lets them let their guard down a little bit. And uh, I'm definitely taking up that mariachi band thing though. It's <laughs> a great one. Yeah. The last trend that we saw is how these CEOs involve their customers. They really invite them into their community. Will Dryden will share something he does as well as Brian, and then I'll share a couple other examples. Okay, so. Um, and here's, is this your team? This is actually uh, a lot of our customers here. Okay. I'll give a little story about that too. Uh, when we opened, we broke a paradigm. Flight training was boring. It wasn't sexy, as I said, and uh, all of aviation is like that. I'm not kidding. We're, one of only a couple schools in the entire country that do something called scenario-based training, which is we take what your business goals are, whether they're in different cities, or pleasure. There's 5,500 general aviation airports that you can go to versus 800 airline airports. And we figure out an itinerary of everywhere you want to go. And we do your flight training going to those places, whether it's I want to go to Santa Barbara and take my wife to wine country, or I work in Phoenix, or I have a house in Mammoth, or I just like flying over San Diego, whatever it is. We customize the program for that. Well, that's totally against everything that aviation has said before. It's you train to pass a test, and you pass a test, and then you're scared to death to take your friends flying because you haven't gone anywhere. So <laughs> we had to create this uh, organization. Uh, it's the Coast Pilot Association. And it takes all the customers in the field, whether the pilots, aspiring pilots, or just for the love of av aviation. It brings them in, and it allows us to educate to them what this scenario-based training thing is because it's so different. And then we get natural feedback from this. This is a trip we did down to Mexico. We actually took uh, four airplanes on this. We fly in formation down. We do low levels over the Sea of Cortez. And this is the, the group, this motley crew here. And we just went fishing and played golf and had a great time. You know, that costs a lot of money for those trips. If you can't afford that, there's more local stuff. But 
all these trips, all these groups from the, or all the stuff from the Coast Pilot Association allows us to get amazing feedback of things that they want to do that I've never thought of, and then we pass it on to the rest of our customers. So if, if you can't listen, and this organization allows us to listen, then you're gonna just stay stagnant, you're gonna stay flat, so listen. Thank you. Brian, how do you get your customers involved? Well, it's, it's a challenge because in our, in our industry, we're very commoditized. This is a, a, a very specialized business that Will's in. It sounds like a lot of fun. And he was telling me before, you could take a trip to go somewhere just for the food. He likes to base their trips around food. Well, that's, that does sound like a hell of a lot of fun. And, and <laughs> get approval, maybe we'll do that one of these days. But uh, uh, you know, for, for us, um, just ha being the voice of the customer, talking with the customers as often as possible on big, big picture ideas, like when we went out to um, create Superior Onsite, we, we pooled a lot of our larger, more loyal and smaller customers and ask them what they wanted. What, did, what exactly could help you better if we were, if it could be anything? And keep in mind, we're selling nuts and bolts, golf cars, service, brakes, tires, nothing all that exciting. But we asked them, what would you like to see? And what the, the unanimous decision was, or res response was, we'd like you to come to us instead of having to go to you. So by bringing these customers in and asking them, you know, what, what pains you, what can we do for you, we, we engage them. And some of them have been very loyal to us, of course, and without their input, I mean, I think I might have the best ideas, the most innovative, fun ideas, but what it comes down to, it doesn't pencil out necessarily until you ask your customers. So you, you have to be confident and have those relationships put in place with, the, with people that you can go to in their, you know, in their confidence and say, I want to do this, what do you think? And let them tear it apart because a lot of times the people in your organization are going to say, yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. idea, uh-huh, let's do it. What's this going to cost? Um, it's not their money, so a lot of times they don't, they don't really see the ramifications. But your customers will tell you when you're on to something good. And so we listen. Thank you. Also, Michael Fennison, the CEO of Pure Financial, shared with me that they touch their clients regularly up to 40 times a year. So it's not just through electronic and mail communication, but they also invite them to educational events and social events. Same with Deb Huber's La Vida Pharmaceuticals. They hold physician-hosted roundtables to educate their customers. And TG, TGG Accounting's Matt Garrett has client appreciation events. And I think there's one coming up. So one of the questions I asked all of the CEOs was, if leader, fill in the blank, if leaders would only blank, they could be so much more successful. So what do you think that blank was? Follow. Follow. Listen, follow. Lead. Serve. Serve. Pretty good. Here's what most of them said. Very powerful. Um, one thing Michael Fennison said is if leaders would only not get drawn into the day-to-day -day minutia, they could be so much more successful. And he talked about the importance of not getting caught up in the day-to-day -day challenges and removing yourself and thinking about where you want your company to go. So when I shared the example with you of the adolescence phase where the leader starts to let go a little bit and not get so mired in the details, that was a perfect example that he shared. Dave Dutch of Paley said, if leaders would trust their teams more, they'd be so much more successful. Any surprises here? Here's a quote I love from Ken Blanchard. If God had wanted us to talk more than listen, he would have given us two <laughs> mouths rather than two ears. Hmm. So when you think about these themes that came up in the research that these successful CEOs are practicing, there's some things that I would recommend, regardless of the size of company you have, that you could stop doing and start doing. So in terms of the stop doing, 
So I see a lot in the companies I work with when there's a lot, there's rapid growth, they hire quickly and they hire sometimes who's around, who has been referred to them, which could work out and it could not. One thing I think is very important is to take a moment and as a leader and think about what's the culture that I want to create? What type of people do I want working with my customers? What kind of personality would they have? And really hiring around that. Of course, if you have two people who have exactly the same technical background, that's great. You look at which one would be a better fit for the organization and hire to that. Um, innovation. Again, off-site meetings are great, but think of ways to create innovation on a regular basis in your company uh, and create that challenge for employees where they know once a week, every couple weeks, they need to come in with a new idea and reward that. So when we talk about creating a culture that you want, when it's, reg it's consistent that you're expected to bring in ideas and it's rewarded, people will feel good about it and they'll continue to do it, especially when those ideas are implemented, like the one Brian shared with his company uh, doing work in Mexico. In terms of communication, stop being the person behind the curtain. Stop being the person working in your office on email or the person who's always out of the office and just get involved. Walk around, management by walking around. Talk to your employees. Ask them questions. Ask them for their suggestions. Uh, in terms of employee development, stop seeing it as a costly privilege and start seeing it as a way to get employees engaged and excited and passionate about their work and also see it as a way to have succession planning because when you're developing your people and you're creating the right environment, they're more likely to stay with you. There's less turnover as all the research on employee engagement demonstrates. So it's a really long-term investment. Don't think of it in the short term. Accountability, okay, so this goes in either extreme. Some companies don't do much around accountability and some people have very complicated accountability systems where the performance reviews are 10 pages and after the fourth page, I'm just understanding why the managers are mad <laughs> and they don't get them in on time and why HR is so frustrated, I get it. Uh, come up with a system that's simple to use and four times a year, make sure people are getting follow-up on their quarterly goals. So at the end of the year, it's not this big headache for the managers. Make feedback a part of your culture. Community and fun. Stop expecting people to do a good job because they're lucky to have a job in this economy. <laughs> Create a more relaxed environment if that's what fits with the culture you want. Start a suggestion box. Get a coach. And decide what is the culture you want to create and make it happen. And last, inviting customers to join the community. Don't just uh, email or mail out flyers and information. Invite your customers in. Do like uh, Will did and have them share your ideas and have them tear it apart and tell you why it's great and why it's not. Have educational events. I'd like to close with this quote. The only thing of real importance that leaders do is create and manage culture. If you do not manage culture, it manages you and you may not even be aware of the extent to which this is happening. Thank you all for your time. You can download the full report on here. And thank you to our CEOs.